Tony D'Angelo is officially back. Tarasenko is off the free agency board and is signed in Ottawa. But above all, the franchise player has been inked for another eight seasons. We're going to talk about all that and a little bit more. Hey guys, sorry there wasn't a weekly show last weekend. There wasn't really a whole lot to talk about, and I don't want to be redundant. At least, you know, within reason. You know, during summertime, it's kind of redundant to begin with. You have free agency, you have the draft. You might have dead silence, you might have a move here or there and everything like that. But not a whole lot was going on. But before I head down to Richmond Raceway for the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series and the Cup Series over the weekend, I wanted to at least reply to all the comments. I've gotten a good amount of them. And they've been really intuitive, and they offer a lot of good subject matter to discuss. Most of you are also repeat commenters, and you keep coming back, you keep watching the videos and sharing them with your friends, and I really, really appreciate that. Thank you all very much. All right, so the first comment we have here today, this was on the last episode of Morning Take Weekly. This was from Tyler Copeland. Loving the videos, brother. Keep doing your thing. The way you go in-depth with literally every segment of the video is unmatched. I'm hoping we can still make a move for a true true goal score, and I'm not exactly sure if that's Tarasenko. Very excited for this season. Let's go, Canes. All right, Tyler, again, thank you for the comment. So, Tarasenko being off the board now, this is kind of a good thing because had the Hurricanes went out and signed him, they're kind of putting themselves in you know a tough spot with the cap and everything like that. In the event that you have... Pesci, Shea, Chatfield, Teravine, and Jury as far as forwards go. But Pesci, Shea, and Chatfield on defense are all potentially guys that could get moved, I think. Having a tough time deciding. Shea going is pretty inevitable at this point, I think. Um, because you got Orlov, you got someone who does have a lot. You grab someone who does have a lot of what's in Shea's skill set. Orlov's way of providing offense is a little bit different from Brady Shea. Orlov is more likely just to try and find a lane and get a really hard clap bomb off, whereas someone like Shea is more likely to kind of walk it down to the dot and take a silent wrister or go for a snapshot or something like that. So in that in that regard, they're different. They're both very physical players, but I would definitely say Orlov is definitely more physical. I would also say Orlov is a little bit more well-rounded, so I think the writing is on the wall for Shea. Um... With Tony D'Angelo coming back, the writing is now on the wall for Pesci and or Chatfield. I don't think it'll be both of them. As far as what would be a more lucrative return, that would be Pesci. So the one good thing about Tarasenko being off the board is you probably have to trade somebody that mitigates the issue of being up against the cap because you bring salary back in when you trade for somebody, but you also move salary out. So if you get Shea and Pesci off the board, which those two potentially... You could package them up and ship them off as a pair and you could get a remarkable return because you're basically getting a ready-made defensive pair. They were one of, if not the best pair in the league last season and they were still the second pair on the Hurricanes, so that should tell you something about the defensive depth that they have. I would say if you do ship both of them off, you might be able to get a package deal for them and everything. You, you get that salary you need off the books and you bring in the player or players that you need at the same time. So, at the end of the comment replies, which I think I have seven of them that I'm going to reply to, at the end of those I'm going to talk about how I think that maybe the possibility of getting William Nylander is opened up, and I think Ajo's contract has kind of set the market for forwards now. And I'll get to that in a little bit, but I definitely think that it's kind of becoming a realistic possibility that the Hurricanes could bring him in. Tyler, thank you very much for the comment. So we're on to the next comment, which was also from the last Morning Take Weekly show. It's from that Edmund guy. Two-part question, he says, One, how weird is it that the Canes aren't using Pesci as their own rental as they've done traditionally with guys in their last year? And number two, Adam Gold speculated the team thinks Pesci may have lost a step and makes the team hesitant to extend. Do you buy that theory? So... I gave a pretty extensive reply in my comment when I replied to the comment actually in the comment section. Now I'm going to give an even further detailed one, especially to the second one. So when it comes to the first question, I would say while the Canes have traditionally done that, you know, one of the most recent examples being Trocheck, I'm really so much worried about Trocheck walking because they had Kokaniemi already. Now, was Kokaniemi a one-for-one -one replication of Trocek's production? Absolutely not. At least not yet. I think that potential is there. I think the potential this season for Natchez to be moved to center is there, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. The reason I think that they're not 
going to treat Pesci as an own rental is they can get assets for him now if they were to trade him, and they can move Chatfield up immediately. And then there's also the prospect of Nikishin being over here in two years, Morrow signing at the end of this collegiate season or at some point in the next couple of seasons. Pesci is an asset that you could potentially sell off and get something and get a lot back for. He was a homegrown and developed defenseman, and I think that's part of the reason why they feel like they have to get something for him if they trade him, because they've invested a lot of time and a lot of money into Brett Pesci. Just what I would prefer for them to do if they're going to trade him is get us a piece to win now, not any more future assets because we've got so many draft picks and prospects that it's just not even funny. Another reason I think they're making sure that they're so intent on getting assets back for a defenseman, the Hurricanes have held true to not drafting a defenseman in the first round. Tom Dundon set that standard, and it has stayed that way. For example, in this past draft, we only drafted one defenseman. And to point number two, um, I, I'm, I don't like to trash anybody else, but I will say this. I'm not the biggest Adam Gold fan. I don't want to call him a shock jock because I think people overuse that term a lot. But I don't really care for a lot of his takes on things. For example, I think there's one that we can all agree was a bad take here, especially in hindsight, especially with history being what it is. Draft lottery took place for the 2018 draft. Consensus completely across the board that the guy that the Hurricanes needed to draft was Svechnikov. Svechnikov would be of immediate impact. He'd fill a lot of needs. He would add physicality. He can score. And... Just when it comes right down to it, out of all the players available, he was literally the second best available behind Rasmus Dahlin. And in the event the Hurricanes had won the first overall pick, I think you consider trading it to get the pick where you get Svechnikov because it's a position of need and you're still getting one of the two best players available in the whole draft. But Adam Gold tweeted that there was something about that there was a ton of parity between the top 10 players in the draft or something like that. And then he said, I think we should draft Brady Kachuk, or I like Brady Kachuk, or something along those lines. Brady Kachuk is a great player, but he's not Andrei Svechnikov. So, I don't care for a lot of hits, takes, and then Luke DeCock jumped in there and said that we were going to trade the pick because the new ownership wasn't going to be married to it, and he had absolutely no reason to believe that, and neither did anyone else, and they still said it. Now, to answer your question, when it comes to Pesci maybe losing a step and they're reluctant to extend him, the thing with the shutdown defenseman, the stay-at-home defenseman, whatever you want to call them. One, when they lose a step, it's hard to notice. It's actually very subtle when someone who plays that type of game starts to lose a step. So guys who play a game like that, we'll keep it narrowed down to defensemen just to keep it simple. So guys who play more of a stay-at-home shutdown type of game like Brett Pesci does, like Jacob Slavin does, you don't really notice them losing a step right off the hop. It's pretty subtle when they lose a step. It's I don't want to say it's inconsequential, but it's kind of hard to notice. And just to keep it narrowed down to defensemen here, when a puck-moving defenseman, someone like Burnsy, loses a step, you tend to notice, even though he is performing incredibly well for being 38 years old. Whereas if there was a hesitancy to extend Pesci based on that, I don't think they'd even really be talking to him. More than anything with this front office, I think once they set a price, once they say, we will pay you this and we will give you this term, they don't really offer a whole lot of wiggle room. There's not a whole lot to negotiate with. There's not a whole lot to leverage. And here's the weird thing about it, particularly with Pesci. A bunch of stuff went out in the media. A bunch of it. And then it's almost like it was quiet. Pagnota said the thing that he said that one time about Pesci interest in Vancouver, Nashville, and whatever the other team was, and that he had a 15-team no-trade clause, and here's what was weird about it. I went and looked, and that trade clause wasn't listed there. I actually spoke about that on either my last weekly show or the one before that. Pesci did not have a no-trade clause, and that turns out to not be true. He does, in fact, have a modified trade clause with a 15-team trade list. Brett Pesci also, or I'm sorry, Brady Shea also has a 10-team no-trade list on his contract as well. That might be why there's a little bit of difficulty moving them, and those factors might be why those guys end up staying on the Hurricanes and do get treated as own rentals. That's a distinct possibility here. But more than anything, I think what it comes down to is they want to get assets back for someone who they have invested so much time and money into as they have someone like Brett Pesci. Brady Shea, on the other hand, there wasn't a big time or money investment there. He was acquired through trade. Not a ton was given up to get him. So ultimately, no, I do not buy that theory. I don't think it has anything to do with Pesci's performance. Um, more than anything, I think that, so Damon Severson's contract kind of set the market for defensemen. 
and that kind of eliminated what I thought was going to be kind of the max for Pesci being a 6x6, I think would have been perfect for him. She changed to a really, really aggressive agent just because this team kind of already did have a reputation of being very reluctant to pay players. So in that regard, I don't blame Pesci at all for taking that extra step there to make sure that he got his money because like I talked about on my last video, Marcus Nudevar is one of the most recent examples of it. You have to get the money that you can while you can because in a split second, you playing can be over. You take one bad fall, you take one bad hit, you take one puck to the wrong place, you could be done. So... I would like to see Pesci stay, but the longer and longer this drags on, I don't think that it's very likely. I also would not be surprised if he's still with the team even as far as up until preseason time frame. We saw that with Justin Falk. He was actually, he played in a couple of preseason games with the Hurricanes, and he wasn't at an autograph event one night, I believe was the case. And he was traded to St. Louis, and then Joel Edmondson and Dominic Bach came back the other way. Though we do see him get moved, but it's several months from now before it finally happens. Edmund Guy, thank you very much for the comment. I hope you keep coming back. All right, Eric Heinke, 2865. Thanks. I've seen you comment before. You've actually commented a few times. I really appreciate it. He says, when is Brett or Brady getting traded? We need another offensive scoring forward. Buddy, your guess is as good as mine on that one. This has drug out a really long time, and I've basically... My finger was falling off from hitting the refresh button for a couple of weeks. I know I just speculated a lot with the last comment about what could happen, but at this point, anything could happen. It could be... At this point, anything really could happen. So, if you trade Pesci and hold on to Shea, if Shea's willing to play third pair minutes, you put him with Chatfield. But then you also got D'Angelo back, and you don't pay a guy $1.6 million to be the seventh defenseman. And I don't think he's going anywhere. The Hurricanes really wanted him back. So, I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. I'm, ex I'm expecting there to be some big bombshell trade at some point or another that comes out of nowhere at like 3 o'clock in the morning when we're all asleep. It's Whatever's going to happen, is it's beyond my ability to comprehend it at this point. There's so many different possibilities now. But I, I don't even want to speculate if one's going to go, if they're both going to go, if we're getting a forward back, if Eric Carlson's still on the table. I personally don't believe he is. And I don't have any insiders. or I'm not an insider. I don't have any sources. This is all speculation stuff and research based on research I do and I do this primarily for fun um, I'm hoping we do get that other guy but later on in the show I'm going to talk about how we could potentially maybe look at getting William Nylander I'll get to that in a little bit thank you very much for the comment I appreciate it our next comment here is from S Stephen Cocote 4119 please excuse me if I mispronounced that this is in response to my Alexander Nikishin video he says boom belongs in the NHL yeah, uh, dude, um, so to tide everybody over until he can get here, and it is looking more and more like a Kaprizov situation, and the way that things are shaping up right now, Alexander Nikishin could be on the second pair on day one, in my opinion, if not the top pair, and him being a left-handed defenseman, say in the future, Nikishin could be paired with Moro, Nikishin could be paired with D'Angelo, you've got a really awesome one-two punch on in your top four defense because both your left-handed guys are two of the best defensemen in the league. You've got Slavin relies more on good timing, poke checking, who relies on good cap control by timing. It's very finesse, his poke checking and everything like that. Alexander Nikishin, I would describe him as a complete defenseman. Um, he uses everything that he's got. He uses the size. He's very physical. He also has a huge offensive upside, and by no means is he a traffic cone, and on the few occasions that I have seen him get burned of what I've watched, he gave the attacking players opportunity to score. So, unfortunately, he's still got to wait for his contract to run out before he gets over here, but I am working on the highlight package for him. I just want to finish my Aho and Brendamore video first, and finding enough highlights of him that were adequate for what I wanted to do has been difficult and I'm still looking. I actually found some stuff from where he was playing in the Beijing Olympics and that was helping me find the other stuff that I wanted to find because finding him scoring goals and finding him hitting people, that stuff wasn't hard. But in order for me to illustrate the point that I have in regards to Alex Nikishin that he's a complete defenseman, like if you divide up the pie chart of all the things that you need in a hockey player, all the things you need in an NHL defenseman, Alexander Nikishin covers each of them equally in my opinion. Really excited about that kid. I hope he can make it over here sooner rather than later. But, you know, if he could get over here right now, then we'd have, like, you know, our 100th defenseman. 
it's kind of insane, like, the fact that we have the defense we have, we have the logjam we have, and we still have Nikishin and Moro, and that's before you're even talking about some of the other guys we have. But out of all the players I'm really excited about, and I've learned to not get my hopes up, thank you, Zach Boychuk, I am really, really excited about that kid. and probably at least be the best defenseman on the team. But if he ends up being the best player on the team overall, if he is overtaking Ajo in the regard of the definitive best player on the team, I am not complaining about it because that dude is absolutely nasty. So, Steven, thank you very much for the comment. I will see you next time. So, Sir Sydney Live replied to a, a post that I put up of Tony D'Angelo saying, hey, who's our favorite power play quarterback, even though he does have some traffic cone tendencies. And it's a funny picture if you haven't seen it. It's one of the posts, and it got him like pointing at the screen and everything like that. And Sir Sydney Live, thank you for the comment. He says the guy on the screen right now. I'm really happy about having him back. He's going to provide two things that the Hurricanes desperately need. And as I've stated before, once you know he gets a little bit of coaching from Gleason and takes a few pointers from Slavin and everything, I think he can be a lot more defensively competent than he ever has been because he definitely made improvements on it the last time he was in Carolina backslid a little bit while he was in Philly, but I think that he made a good enough foundation in the system here to where he can build on that and get back to where he was and be even better. All right, and so we have for our last comment here, this one is also from that Edmund guy, and I saved this one for last for a reason. Um, I really appreciate you making this comment because it gives me a good chance to say some stuff that I'd like to say in regards to how he was treated in that first press conference. Um, so that Edmund guy says, hopefully local media doesn't find it super necessary to ask Tony D any January 6 questions on his introductory press conference actually happened last time. Yeah, so that pissed me off. I'm just going to be straight with you guys. Um, like I said, this is not a political channel. It never will be a political channel. Hell, I'm not even really a political person. Um, part of that being is I was in the military and I've been an instrument of, you know, policy and legislation and everything like that for about eight years of my life so it's not exactly something i want to concern myself with now that i've been out for several years um now in the case of tony d'angelo here is the thing that i want to draw with that sarah sivian was the one who asked him that question as i told you when i replied to you Sarah Sivian was someone who i did not care for when she was covering the hurricanes full-time she definitely was not a objective reporter by any means with the hurricanes she was always putting her personal opinions and her agenda and her ideology into a lot of the work that she did i'm glad that i didn't pay money for the athletic at that point because i really didn't want to read anything that she wrote so she jumped on that immediately she didn't ask anything about hockey or anything like that now here's the point that i want to make with that to contrast it Let's say that Blake Wheeler is very outspoken, and it's a very well-known fact that when it comes to politics, he is pretty much the exact opposite of Tony D'Angelo. It could He could not be any different than him. Um, if Tony D'Angelo is oil, Blake Wheeler is water. So a lot of people would say, oh, it's not about Tony's politics, it's about that he's a defensive liability, and if they don't say that it's because he's a defensive liability, they talk about the problems that he's had in the past in the locker room. So here's a couple of points I want to make to that. One, we weren't there, we don't know what actually happened. Here's say otherwise, just because a bunch of people say something happened, we also have to remember that people were out to get Tony D'Angelo from day one. Now, the other th point that I want to make here, let's say... So well, let's say Blake Wheeler comes to Carolina and Sarah Sivian in some alternate reality, she's on the other side of the political spectrum and she starts to bombard him about something political or if she can't get him there, she immediately goes to, hey, is it true that you and Mark Shifley bullied Patrick Line out of Winnipeg? His first press conference as a hurricane. Ask him relevant questions. Ask him stuff about the game. About the game. Ask him stuff about the organization. Hell, ask him what his shoe size is. I don't give a damn. I don't like politics being in sports. So as long as traditional sports media is still around, which I'm really kind of hoping it goes away, but, you know, that's a story for, you know, its own video. So long as it's around, I wish they would extend that courtesy to everybody because Sarah Sivian totally tried to do a hit job on Tony D'Angelo, and regardless of what I think about his politics, I like his game, and he seems to fit in the locker room really well. Not to mention, if this guy is so disliked, why was he at Brett Pesci's wedding? And I remember when Trocek was still on the team, there was a picture that they posted on Instagram or something like that. I saw it on Reddit. That's where I tend to browse to find out stuff about the Canes and everything like that. 
there was a picture that Shea took. He's in the passenger seat of Trocek's car. Trocek's driving, and for once, Tony D'Angelo wasn't the shortest guy in the car because Trocek's son was back there, too, and they were dropping him off at school. You don't want to be around them yourself, much less let them be around your kids. So, regardless of what someone's reputation is, of what they did before, we all make mistakes, we all do stupid things, and if you knew the opinions of every single person around you, if you knew how someone felt on every single issue, every single subject, you wouldn't like anybody. I'm not saying you specifically, but I think people in general, if you knew how everybody felt about everything, you probably wouldn't have many friends at all. So, hopefully that won't happen this time around, and so far of all the interviews that he's had, he's, out of all the interviews he's had, Nothing like that has been brought up, not that I've seen anyway. So I'm hoping it stays that way. He should be extended that courtesy, and so should every single player that comes to this organization or goes to play for a professional sports team in general. So, yeah, you can see my dog My dog even agrees. He's just like, yeah, I'm going back to sleep. He just perked up for a second to agree, and now he's going back to sleep. So, yeah. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but so far it is not. Edmund Guy, thank you very much for both your comments, and I hope to hear more from you soon. Okay, so Ajo signing his contract, which is excellent in my opinion, 9.75 for him, absolute steal as I've stated before, has also kind of set the market for a lot of other forwards, most notably William Nylander. It is no secret the Maple Leafs need defense, and Pesci being traded for Nylander was something that was rumored a few years ago anyway. Um, it wouldn't have been a good trade at the time. Now I think it potentially could be. So watching William Nylander play and everything like that, I definitely think he'd be a good fit in the Canes in the regard of he's an incredibly hard worker, he skates really hard, he forechecks really well, but above all, he can score, and I think that's what the Hurricanes need the most. He's a right-handed shot who can score, and they don't have a ton of that. So now the trouble with William Nylander is he allegedly wants a $10 million deal, and Ajo just basically kind of gave him the ammo to get a $10 million. Part of the reason he may be demanding or is allegedly demanding $10 million may be because of some of his teammates. So here's one theory of mine. I don't think Nylander is necessarily demanding $10 million because he's puffing his chest out and saying, I'm William Nylander and my dad is Michael Nylander. I don't think that's it. Going into this upcoming season, he does in fact have a modified no trade clause. So he And his modified no trade clause is he submits a 10-team no trade list. So, I don't know if Carolina is on that list or not. I don't know if he'd be willing to come to Carolina, but I'm going to make a case why the Hurricanes could maybe potentially try to get him. So, I think part of the reason he's looking for $10 million is he wants to be in the same range as the other three forwards on the team that are paid about the same. The only three forwards on the team making more than him right now are Austin Matthews, who's making $11,640,000. And 250. John Tavares is at an even $11 million cap hit, and Mitch Marner is at $10,903,000. So, and by comparison, Nylander comes in at $6,962,366. So we'll just say 6.97 to keep it simple. So I think the reason he's really demanding that money is like, hey, you paid the other star forwards, I'm one of the core four, why am I not getting looked at to have the same type of contract? One, you could potentially lose him after the season's over because he's UFA if you don't get an extension in place before that. But as far as him being someone who could get the Hurricanes over the hump, he's definitely potentially one of those guys. He might not be the one and only piece you need, but having him with Ajo and Jarvis could be remarkable, or having him in the top six in any way could really help. But I would absolutely love to see someone like Nylander with I would absolutely love to see someone like Nylander with Ajo because the little sample size we got of like Pacioretty with Ajo was really great. Nylander is much younger. He doesn't have nearly the injury history that Max Pacioretty has. When Tree Living took over the Leafs, he said that the core four are safe, but I think he's going to say that regardless. So I actually didn't finish the show last night, but I'm recording the last segment of it now just so I can finish the uh, one last thought that I had and everything like that. So ultimately to finish off this segment and kind of the whole show, um, another thing that the Ajo contract did, it basically told the entire league, this is the absolute maximum we will pay a player, and you probably won't even get this. $8 million in Raleigh is a lot more than $8 million in Toronto. So, potentially you could get Nylander to come here, and his take-home pay would have about the same take-home pay for an $8 million cap hit that you would for a $10 million cap hit in Toronto. So maybe you could look at something like that. Now, acquiring a right-handed goal-scoring winger like Nylander, you still have the 2C thing that you have to address. The first aspect of that is, 
Does Kokaniemi take the next step and start scoring more? Perhaps. Do you go out and get somebody like Elias Lindholm? Perhaps. But in all the research that I've been doing lately, I've been thinking about something else. Martin Nature is being a natural center and has played that position pretty much his entire life up until he came to the Hurricanes. And I'm going to make a separate video about this particular topic because it's pretty intriguing to me. I think I found out what Brendan Moore's reluctancy is with putting him at center, and it basically boils down to, on the breakouts, basically he flies the defensive zone a little prematurely. He breaks out a little bit too early, and sometimes it leaves the middle of the ice open and somebody's not getting covered. So... As far as his ability to be a little bit more freewheeling and to make offense and to create good transitions and everything like that, I think Natchez has all that in his toolkit. But the other thing to look at with that is, if you do move him over to center, does he become more of a defensive liability as a center? Brendan Moore is not going to play somebody at the center ice position unless they have a defensive game. It's just the way that the team is ran. You have enough defensive competency on the team as a whole at this point, I think, to where you can kind of turn Natchez loose. You can maybe put Natchez at center, turn him loose and see what he can create in transition. You'll get more clean entries. You'll probably have an increase in scoring if you do that. Um, maybe he'll loosen the reins on Ajo a little bit and let him use that creativity that he has as well while still maintaining that really great 200-foot defensive game that he has. Martin Natchez centering William Nylander and Andre Svechnikov, for example, or William Nylander and Michael Bunting, that could be incredibly interesting. So we'll see. But... That's all I've got for today. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Please like, comment, share, subscribe. Um, the Buy Me A Coffee link's in the description if you want to donate to my work. I would like to get to a better camera eventually and everything like that. Thank you very much. I will see you guys next week. Have a good day.